And as time and history move on seemingly together, as one cannot exist without the other, it's undoubtedly certain that society will evolutionize over time. However, it's quite common and very clear that certain practices and culture types of society begin to fade and dwindle, leaving most of its inhabitants at a loss for understanding or yearning for a time similar to the one that had passed. You may have heard this before, and in fact, I've mentioned it in one of my other videos, which if you're looking for a wild ride down the rabbit hole, I'll leave a link to that in the description below. The feeling I'm referring to in both videos, this one and the one prior, is nostalgia, something both damn near evil and angelic. Yet to talk about nostalgia is a whole nother factor and a whole nother video because it's a boss battle in and of itself. But what I mean here is that the more the society moves forward, the more will be forgotten. It's the sad, unfortunate truth. Think of it as a spread of peanut butter. As you glide your knife or spoon across a slice of bread or whatever you're spreading it over, as you move from right to left or left to right, it'll thin out as you go. It'll leave itself behind and eventually you'll need to get more in order to fill the area with peanut butter. Each time you dig into the jar and get more, that is a new era of society. It spreads thin and the cycle continues. This analogy is important because it truly highlights exactly what happens to cultures and art forms over time as we move forward into the new world as it moves itself seemingly effortlessly and endlessly. In this case, there is one particular art form that I think has been appreciated yet overlooked. It's one that we'll be discussing in this video, but first, we need some prior context in order to understand a video like this one. I think that the art form I'm talking about has been taken for granted and forgotten about all at once. It's ironic and confusing. It's an odd mixture of it's here, but not here. Similar to that of your favorite song. Although it is here, and it will be essentially forever, it is not truly here. It's an abstract concept, and I don't expect anyone to understand it straight off the bat or out the gate. Uh, let's say that your favorite song is from a certain point in time. That song, depending on when it was popular or released, is no longer relevant within the eyes of the masses and mainstream society. Thus, it is here, and it can still be listened to, but it's no longer something that mainstream society is actively engaged with, or has priorly engaged with it after its popularity. This concept applies to most things in life, however, they can always be revived, relived, or revamped, or even ongoing, especially during the internet age that we're in now. Things from what seemed like forever ago can suddenly make a comeback out of thin air. Which brings me to the headline of tonight's video, and the specific art form that I'm talking about, I think at one time was the cultural glue that held society together, but now it's just seen as a fix, something to scratch the itch, or something that's been given on demand without actually understanding why we want it so much, and understanding why we want it so much requires us to go pretty in depth, and that is what we will discover, here, together. We will discover how it's taken over in ways that people still can't even think about today. The ways that people can't even fathom or believe of how it's done wonders for us. It wins in the end. It always does. And it always will. in which the title was written could be reworded. I'll be honest, you could reword it as visual storytelling and interactive learning, it truly wouldn't matter. Both mediums pose the same list of criteria. You have interactive storytelling and visual learning, or you have visual storytelling and interactive learning. No matter which way you word it, they all offer the same types of engagement. In fact, most of the time while one is going on, the other is happening simultaneously. And most of the time, people have no idea what's going on, which is what the creators want. But let it be known that to even talk about this would force us to break the fourth wall and shower the illusion of the very mediums we're looking at. It, just for a moment, I promise. Uh, when we look at video games and manga, or even anime for that matter, all three are not only mainstream, but also pose a question that within this video, hopefully, we'll be able to answer together. So, let's pick the question. Why is storytelling so important, and how is it crucial to our society? But, great, this now offers a sub-question we have to figure out. Why is it that through video games, manga, and even anime, the art form storytelling becomes so captivating? Jeez, both of these questions are pretty complex, but I think together we'll be able to find out exactly where the answers are, and it'll give us a better understanding about why the art form storytelling is crucial to our society, and how it's even become overlooked, yet demanded by the masses. 
you know, I guess a thought I'll let you ponder on your own is, how can something that isn't taught enough in the school system, not encouraged enough by members of society, and not appreciated as much by the general public, be in such high demand? Let me know your thoughts in the comments if you want. You don't have to, but I try to get people engaged, and it's always nice when there's a conversation going on and people are learning from one another. A anyways, look, this whole conversation leads to so many more questions, and it seems like every time we discover one question, it leads to another. Alright guys, we're at the top of this, and to answer all of these questions, we need to get to the bottom. Okay, let's start with what we know by default. If we're gonna solve this mystery, we have to look at square one. Storytelling is clearly a need, right? Okay, so I guess we should start with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. After all, storytelling through video games and manga clearly is offering something of value that people need in their lives. Everything from connection to love and belonging, validation, entertainment, coping mechanisms and strategies, it's offering something, right? But what? We should consult the chart. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a simple pyramid chart. It labels what people in society desire or need in levels or tiers. Uh, think of it like a video game. Before you can have the level above, you need to unlock them one at a time and the level prior. The Wikipedia definition of Maslow's hierarchy of needs says, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is an idea in psychology proposed by American Abraham Maslow in his 1943 paper, A Theory of Human Motivation. In the Journal of Psychological Review, Maslow subsequently extended the idea to include his observations of humans innate curiosity. You see, a person can't survive without food, I think we all know this. However, once they have that, then they can move up to the next level, then require shelter, then love and belonging, then self-esteem, so on and so on. One level feeds into another. Just missing one of these will mess up a person's life. Imagine missing several. Although, I would like to challenge myself for a second. This is debatable, because psychology is not a true science, it is a pseudoscience, and it is very easily discreditable. To stake a claim in what someone does, or how they think, or why they do what they do, is very hard to assert. Unless you have solid evidence or an ability to showcase that idea, rather through experience or some sort of outside knowledge. People overcome and adapt their surroundings, environment, and with the times. So this pyramid may actually be inverted like so, like this. With the order still going from bottom of most basic needs to top in which are less important, disruptive architecture like social media or other products that can alter the way people interact with the world on and offline, this pyramid can now come in several different variations, especially when we put into perspective of what each person is trying to achieve, and let's try and create a few examples. So let's just rearrange these here for a moment, and while you look at these, Keep in mind that the needs of a 13-year-old are different from the needs of a 23-year-old. And yes, hang on, hang on, I know, yes, they can overlap, and that's not always the case. Not overall, but perhaps in a lot of areas. But that's a good thing, though, right? That's what makes friends in a variety of age groups, right? You and your friend or friends have something in common. You guys have common interests. You find someone who is needing the same things as you, and then suddenly it's not so lonely. Now... Here's the issue. If Maslow's hierarchy of needs can be reordered and made in different combinations regarding a variety of factors such as current status, financial placement, housing, personality, or whatever someone is currently desiring at the time, plus you have social media altering how people depict themselves online, we can't truly rely on it. We need to venture deeper into the real world. A chart can only tell us so much. I hate to say it, guys, but... Damn, we can't rely on this. We need something different. Uh, all right, let's think. What's something in the real world that offers storytelling on demand? All right, a streaming service. Yeah, let's start with a streaming service. Uh, oh, I know, Disney Plus. When you look at Disney Plus, for example, if storytelling and visual engagement wasn't so high on the priority of people, why has it made so much money? Okay, yes, you can say because they're Disney and then just dismiss the question, but clearly it is wanted and it is demanded. Yet when someone says, I want to be a storyteller, or I want to create stories for people to enjoy all over the world, parents, teachers, friends, even employers completely shrug them off and then claim that the art form and talent for creating these captivating worlds and colorful cast of characters, a child's game, preposterous. Yet, they would go home that same day and turn on The Mandalorian or their favorite anime. 
which to me is not only double standard, but hypocritical. That's a slap in the face to anyone who wants to be a creator. Look at me, I'm a YouTuber, and even I find that offensive. And I'm a storyteller. It's one of my strongest strengths that I have. Kind of an ironic statement, right? One of the strongest strengths? But I guess it's true though. In any event, this too is a boss battle on its own and should be tackled in another video. So uh, let's just focus on the questions for now, alright? Yet again, I know better than to ignore the fact they're all connected. Uh, anyways, we're going in circles here, guys. We need to start moving forward in a direction. So, why is storytelling so important, and how is it crucial to our society? And why is it that through video games, manga, and even anime, the art from storytelling becomes so captivating? This is the question that we need to answer. And as we continue our expedition through this question, in order to answer it, we need to understand interactive learning. And I think this is a big part of the question. So, what is interactive learning, actually? <laughs> what is that? Well, going back to Wikipedia, <clears throat> interactive learning is a pedagogical approach that incorporates social networking and urban computing into course design and delivery. Interactive learning has involved, excuse me, evolved out of hyper growth and the use of digital technology in virtual communication, particularly by students. In layman's terms, Interactive learning is learning by doing or learning through experience, which I think many can agree to, and is the best kind of learning. You learn by living life. You learn more by living life and learning through activity and experience than you ever would in a classroom. Oh, speaking of classrooms, uh, the Australian National University defines interactive learning as interactive learning is a hands-on real-life approach to education founded upon building student engagement through guided social interaction. Interactive learning is is a holistic methodology that has both online and offline components which together can make a complete educational experience. Carefully designed and constructed and structured activities facilitate learning in groups, fostering a challenging but engaging space for students to wrestle with novel concepts and develop practical skills. Typical homework activities like applying course topics, solving problems, working through issues are done together in class while the classic classroom activities such as you know, hearing course topics explained are done by home watching videos, reading by looking at online resources and other texts. Students then come to class with their curiosity piqued beforehand by engaging with topics in advance and then are given a problem, a project, a case, role play, ooh, role play, or something other interactive you know, that allows students to engage with. Interactive learning exercises which engage with them and their peers and teaching staff in an interactive and energetic learning environment. You know what's funny? Because Harvard University actually agreed upon this. Eric Mazur, or Mazur, or uh, Mazur, I do apologize for butchering his name, but uh, we'll call him Professor Eric for now. It sounds like a Pokemon trainer. Anyways, uh, at Harvard University, uh, Professor Eric, a physics professor at Harvard University, said in an interview done by Harvard that interactive learning makes it impossible to sleep through class. And I completely agree. Being able to go out there and being able to have people learn physically by doing and having real experience will always be the best kind of learning. You can ask a firefighter, a chef, a police officer, someone in the pharmaceutical industry, a teacher, a lawyer, having them in the lab, in the kitchen, in a simulation, or in a real fire will always tell someone how they act and how they learn. You learn by doing, not just by sitting in front of a chalkboard or a whiteboard all day. You see, Wikipedia, Harvard, and the University of Australia give us the answers that we need. So I guess there we have it, right? We have what we came for. Thanks for watching. Partly. Unfortunately, the textbook classroom definition is all that we were given, and we need to apply this to the real world. We're not talking about what it's like learning in the classroom. We're talking about how interactive learning applies to storytelling in the real world. Applying it to the real world is where our focus is and how we will answer all these questions that we've obtained so far. The answers we need on interactive learning we have to an extent. But what kinds of interactive learning or different kinds of interactions through learning or different kinds of learning through interactions are there? If you're outside the school, what is there that you can do? What kinds of learning is available to you? In what ways do we learn without sitting in front of a whiteboard, or back when I was in school, a chalkboard, like I had previously said? 
How do we learn through video games, manga, or even anime? Now we're getting somewhere. You're not gonna believe me, though. We need to look in the most unlikely of places. Believe it or not, part of the answer, and if you want to argue a large part of it, if not all of it, resides in a place where you might not think it would. I think it gets us a few shovel digs deep in when it comes to the larger picture, which is what we've been trying to answer, and so far we've gotten our foot in the right direction. You see, to even grasp how interactive learning pertains to the outside world, how it pertains to outside of the classroom, and how storytelling uses interactive learning, we need to look farther back. I mean, way back. Let's take a trip to the 1940s. With L.A. Noir, Team Bondi and Rockstar Games set out to create a unique crime thriller that explores what it means to be a detective in Hollywood's golden age, one of the most glamorous and most violent periods in the city's history. LAPD, could you stand clear of the body, please? Inspired by real-world cases, players must solve crimes, plots, and conspiracies, all set within the meticulously recreated city of Los Angeles. It's 1947, a time before freeways, in a glamorous city soaked in alcohol, jazz, and corruption. The game blends classic action gameplay, such as shootouts. Put down your weapons! The bank is surrounded! With clue finding and interrogations. Is this yours, Ferdinand? No, I found it near her purse. Critical thinking skills are just as important as surviving skirmishes or chasing criminals. Hold it right there! You play as Cole Phelps, a World War II hero and rookie cop looking to right the wrongs committed during his time in the war. You look spooked, Phelps. It never gets any easier, Bukowski. Phelps works to rise through the ranks of the LAPD, starting in patrol as a beat cop and working his way through traffic, homicide, vice, and arson. Instead of missions or levels, each desk is comprised of self-contained cases. A successfully solved case brings new challenges and leads Cole closer to unveiling the dark heart of the Los Angeles criminal underworld. You're a worn tough guy. You should learn to take a hint. Every case is comprised of several parts, examining a crime scene for clues, questioning witnesses. The wallet by the car. Was there anything in it? Tracking persons of interest an interrogation. Keep lying to me and I'll have you charged and in front of a grand jury before your feet touch the ground. When questioning suspects and witnesses, players analyze their behavior to separate the truth from the lies. You're lying, Miss Coletta. He threw the gun in a bin. By knowing when to doubt or believe a suspect, or when to use evidence to accuse him of a crime, players reveal new clues or open up new lines of inquiry. You deny owning a pistol. I owned a gun, yes, but, but, but it was stolen in a burglary a couple years ago. The foundation is a technology called Motion Scan, a new performance scanning system. Do I have any choice? No, you don't. Motion Scan utilizes 32 high-definition cameras to capture actors' faces, transferring every aspect of their performance into the game, from a telltale blink to a smirk or a flash of anger. Leroy Sabo, you're under arrest. In L.A. Noir, your powers of reason and emotional intelligence can make Jesus, we got him. or break Get out of my sight. each case. It's intense blend of action. And real detective work defies genre conventions to create a unique and captivating thriller that immerses the player in the world of 1940s Los Angeles. This is how a good detective operates. You keep digging and asking questions until you get to the truth. Noir is a perfect example of interactive learning. In fact, it's a perfect example of how video games overall provide interactive learning on an engaging and entertaining level. The three minute and roughly 40 second trailers said it all. L.A. Noir truly teaches us the player to solve cases like a detective and requires the player to use his or her critical thinking skills as well as deductive and inductive reasoning in order to solve them. As the criminal cases get more challenging and the murders are more difficult to solve and even harder to look at, the game will push the player to use facial cues, body language, expressions, and go as far as to having to resort to shootouts when the going gets tough. The game is putting the player in the shoes of an actual detective set in the 1940s. You're learning. Learning by interactively doing. Learning in 
interactively by engaging in the world and its environment constantly, not only in real time, but also by physically playing the game. You know, my dad always told me that life is long learning, and I think this applies to almost everything in life. Not everything, but almost. I'm sure he would argue all things, but I would say that it goes for most things, but not everything. There's always something to learn, sure, and learning is best done when it's done subliminally and done without the need to explain. When you teach someone something to do something and they perform it themselves, the feeling they get is indescribable. This is what game designers do, the magic that they create. And I believe I've said this before, and if I haven't, I'll say it now. A game designer's job is to teach the player without having to explicitly state what to do. They mask the learning by having you wrapped up in the game and its narrative. Game design is the silent language between the player and the developer, between you and the creator. Players are constantly and consistently learning as new information is thrown at them, rather in rapid succession or slowly as the case moves forward, relying on the prior information and having to remember points of interest or key factors of evidence in the case. Notice how they incorporate a notepad. This allows the player to look back and reference information instead of storing it all mentally. This is an interactive version of going back and referring to text or checking your notes. Quite literally, may I mind you, you're learning by doing, actually doing. If you've never played L.A. Noir, or even if you have played L.A. Noir, or to anyone watching this video who has, or at least looked at the walkthrough of the game on YouTube with a quick search, you'll know that L.A. Noir doesn't tell you what to do. It'll give you objectives, but it won't tell you what to do. Once you're done investigating the crime scene, you go back to the car and the story continues as your partner comes along and tells you where to go or you set a destination because you believe there's a point of interest that could lead the case somewhere. There's several clues hidden about and different ways to approach the case. You take the game at your own pace. You learn at your own pace. You inspect every room, every inch of the crime scene, and there's no wrong answer to how you investigate, to how you hold the controller in your, in your hands. You figure out the pieces of the puzzle and they fit together. You're not only learning the controls of the game and learning how to play, but you're learning so much more all at once. You know, doctors actually, believe it or not, are often told or required to play video games, primarily shooters or surgical simulators, to get precision hand-eye coordination, as when you play video games, you can't be staring down at the controller the whole time. You need to look with your eyes, listen with your ears, think with your head, and use your hands and communicate, rather, with the AI or with players all at the same time. It sounds simple, as we all do it every day. But put someone who's never played a game before in that situation, or someone who hasn't played baseball before, and you'll see just how hard it can be. Video games are not easy, and some are downright discouraging. You're asked to do so much at once. It may look like you're lounging about wasting the day, but if only they could see how much information you're processing, how fast and how quickly you react to it, I think people would have a different approach to gaming and see just how much it has to offer the world. Especially when part of this learning is communication. The phrase communication is key you've probably heard before, and frankly, I'm a firm believer in that. If you want a healthy, non-argumentative, and non-toxic relationship, communication is key. Granted, sometimes arguing is healthy and is needed. It happens, and a lot of the time, people will argue if, well, their needs aren't met, or if someone isn't understanding the needs of your significant other, or of you, or whatever. This goes for the workplace as well. Jeez, talk about being needy, huh? Anyways, sometimes in order to understand what a person is wanting from another or why something may upset someone, they may argue and let their emotions run. In the case of video games, however, many games have incorporated a feature that solves this problem when it comes to communication. First of all, they have game chat, which I'm sure everyone knows, but to anyone who is a novice at this, game chat, anyone with a headset can speak into the game and others can hear you. You can also make a party or a group, which allow you to talk to players directly. However, what I want to focus on here isn't so much the lobbies and all that fun stuff. What I want to focus on here is when is there communication when it's limited? How do we learn when there's limited communication? Well, there are several ways of doing this, one of which I will touch upon, which is the emote or emotions or emoticon feature in games. 
in games where you are able to talk to teammates in a very limited sense, or games where you are unable to talk to teammates or other players, you will have to rely on using gestures. Using gestures will allow you to communicate with players, but because the emotions are so vague, you can only use them for so many things, so the player needs to know and learn and figure out exactly what they mean. Speaking of interactive learning and communication, take these three games for example. Let's use Dead by Daylight, Grand Theft Auto V, and Final Fantasy XV Online. Each of these three games allow you to communicate without verbally communicating. You can use body language, gestures, pictures, even text to communicate. Final Fantasy XV Online does this extremely well by allowing the player to use chat dialogues in order to communicate. Communicating in non-conventional means is a form of learning. You're able to communicate without verbal input. It forces the player to learn what someone means through gestures. Wait a minute, isn't there a game for that? Ah, uh, starts with a C. I think, doesn't it? Uh, let me know if you figure it out. Uh, put it in the comments. In the case of L.A. Noir, the learning truly never stops. I mean, every piece of evidence you encounter keeps you on the edge, keeps you on the cusp of another part of the story. Every moment is a hmm or aha moment. And that electro charge that sparks happens again and again and again, all while stringing the player along in a story-driven narrative that keeps the player and the viewers engaged. These moments are similar, if not the exact same, when learning something new. For example, when I'm designing a level or just designing and developing my RPG in general using the Unreal Engine, I figure out what's wrong, connect the nodes and boxes together, and then it works. That aha moment is what keeps people consistently learning. There is no aha moment in school, and when there is, it's rare and it isn't exciting for very long, and usually it doesn't give you any reward. In my opinion, the social system and educational system need to change in a more practical sense and let people show their intelligence and ability to figure things out. But that's a whole nother video and we're not going to be going into that rabbit hole in this one. Interactive learning also comes down to not just physical or in-game functionality and mechanics, and it's not just communication either. It also comes down to the level design and game design. When we talk about game design, it's easy for players to jump up on command to give some kind of strung up opinion about game design, since they're exposed to it every time they play a game. But to understand the nuances, it takes a trained eye and a skill for game development, and not everyone understands it as well as they think they do. Let's take what we've learned with L.A. Noir, for example. Uh, let's break it down. The opening level. Great area to start at. Cole Phelps starts in the alleyway. Alleyways are perfect examples and great ways to introduce the game or have a general starter location because alleyways in general are very narrow, forcing the player to look straight ahead and look around, giving notice on where to go or what to do. Look at how Cole is facing straight down the alleyway. Not only is this foreshadowing in several areas, but notice how his flashlight shines right on the door with the blood spatter on it. The game is telling you, hey, there's blood on the door, go check it out! Now, as we move towards the door, the alleyway becomes more filled with things and more stuff is revealed to us. As the flashlight grows wider, we see a dumpster, a truck, and other items on the ground. This kind of game design teaches us a lot. Don't just look at what's in front of you, explore other areas too. Then look around you, you may find things that aren't in plain sight. Take this gameplay for example. When you look around with your flashlight, you eventually look up and see a gun in the reflection of the window. Well, how do you get up there? The alleyway makes you, the player, Cole, turn to the left and begin to walk in that direction. This tells the player that they are free to explore all other areas of the crime scene, like this one, and not just the one that you start out as. There are several layers to a crime scene, or that there can be several layers to a crime scene. Such as an apartment building, you may have to investigate several floors in order to gain all the evidence you need. This is seen as Cole climbs up a yellow pipe, which by the way is great color choice because you basically are highlighting a climbable surface without actually telling the player. Granted, it is a tutorial and they will tell you, but it's obvious just by how it's colored. And let's look at where it leads. Ralph, there's something on the rooftop. How the hell did you see that? A reflection in the window. Looks like it might be our weapon. I'm gonna see if I can find a way up there. All right, don't hurt yourself.
The gun's up on the roof, right? So we need to find a way up. There are several other games that have brilliant game design. In fact, most games that are loved use some form of interactive learning in some way or other. If we look at Sly Cooper, the first one, Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus, Sly walks up a ramp and is greeted with a curved water tower. Which is kind of ironic, because I'm pretty sure all water towers are curved. Anyways, uh, with a sparkling blue trail, this tells the player that they can shimmy along any surface with a blue trail. However, when approached at the end, there is no blue trail. Instead, there are two antenna-like platforms telling the player that they'll have to jump from platform to platform. Once in rhythm with the game, the player will understand that the best way to move around is to traverse the heights of the map and be as nimble as possible, and running on rooftops will lead to open areas to explore, like in this case, the Interpol Agency in France, where Inspector Carmelita Fox, his love interest, is stationed. Tons of video games do this. Not all of them do it well, but to talk about which ones do it well and which ones not would take a while, even just to give you some examples. And while all this is amazing and whatnot, we need to dive deeper into the next bit about this whole ordeal. We've seen a lot about interactive learning, but what about the storytelling? This seems to be a part of the question that just keeps slipping away from us, and we need to be able to capture this before it's too late. So what about storytelling? With all this learning, surely you're progressing in some way or other, right? As someone who's very much into storytelling, hell, my channel bio even says that as a main topic of interest I cover storytelling, I can assure you that while all this learning is going on, it all takes place in the part of telling some grand story in some small aspect that plays a large role in your experience. Speaking of storytelling, we should look into that side of the entertainment and see how this all fits together. After all, when we play video games, we play it for the story. storytelling, thus it's important how we know all of this learning fits together in the story. L.A. Noir is one of Rockstar Games' masterworks, and it still is to this day for a reason. The cinematography, the characters, the voice acting, the animations, the lifelike expressions, witty dialogue, all wrapped into a 1940s noir-style film game, just blends the most beautiful character development, and you can truly get lost in the story, even just watching the game, not even playing it. That, and Rockstar paid an arm and a leg for the whole cast of Mad Men to play characters in the game. And Mad Men is a fantastic show by all means, but the focus here is that the story is such a well-written narrative, and to put the players in the story and actually play out the actions of the main character, Detective Cole Phelps, you're creating a bond with this character. JRPGs, Japanese role-playing games, my favorite genre, and some of my favorite games like Kingdom Hearts and many others such as Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest Builders 2, Yakuza, Star Ocean, Resonance of Fate, and Sly Cooper are prime examples of this. Each game has its own way of teaching the player how to not only play the game, but how to navigate the world that they're set in and create a unique bond with the player to really get them to feel connected on an emotional level with all of these different elements in play. Everything from the heist of Sly Cooper to the heartbreaking moments of Kingdom Hearts, for example, to the epic and colorful battles and vast world of Final Fantasy, all of which teach you an endless amount of knowledge that cannot be taught traditionally. No matter how much one argues, it is clearly impossible for one to compare what we learn through video games through traditional learning. We also have to remember that video games nowadays are more cinematic and movie-like, and remember, you're playing an interactive movie, essentially, pushing the boundaries of fantastical realism and going far beyond not only what is graphically possible, but also bringing in the player closer and closer into that world. Video games teach you everything, from hand-eye coordination, to critical thinking, to reaction time perfection, to being able to perform tasks of several tasks at a time, may I mind you, yet when we focus on the storytelling aspect, we have to take a different approach to looking at this. We have to look it through the eyes of a storyteller. We can't just do this easily. It's not easy, and it really takes those who have the appreciation of the art form to understand it. It's a kind of art that only a few are able to master, and it's something that I one day hope to share with the world. I love storytelling. I love it so much, and I could be here all day just talking about the stories that I've made and how passionate I am about them and how I want to turn them into games. You know, a great example of storytelling, especially in today's culture, ever since the 90s actually, was anime. 
Anime is a fantastic way to tell stories. It's colorful and vivid worlds with larger-than-life characters really captivate an adventure that we can only dream of going on. It's envy-inducing, and that's a whole problem on its own, actually, that I've covered in another video, which I will also leave a link in the description below. Uh, regardless, we can only dream of that kind of adventure, and as much as people want it, it's never going to happen. Although I do think that in some ways people are making it a reality, which is both good and bad, but that's another topic for another video. The thing is, it's the kind of art that is far beyond any Western way of storytelling. Anime has a beautiful way to tell stories that are just so different from anything else that we've seen. It brings this sense of magic, this air of adventure, this connection to the characters feel real, and above all, it gives the true meaning of friendship, along with other values that I think today's society has truly forgotten. Granted, I can't look at anime with a rose-tinted lens for too long, as there is a dark side. Anime is brilliant. Yet, it doesn't start out on screen. It actually is the visual adaptation for the manga, which is a Japanese comic book that it was published from. Most anime comes from a manga that was turned into a TV show that airs weekly. But here's where my bread and butter comes in. Manga is the written form of storytelling, however, it uses visuals to make the story feel more real. It's not just a comic book, I mean, it is, but it focuses on the emotion of the characters, the posing, the angles, the eyes. Manga is the written form of character expression. Manga focuses on the visuals and story all together at the same time, which I think is common knowledge, but it's amazing to learn how they pull it all off, especially so well, and how some of these mangas run for as long as they do. It's formatted directly directly and differently into panels, and each panel goes in a certain order, and the reader not only has to learn the patterns in which the panels go, but also need to put the words and the actions together in order to understand what's going on. It's the author's job, may I mind you, to make it easier for the reader to understand, but to also keep each page interesting. For example, if we look at the manga I've created, D-Link, you'll see that each panel and page are different, each one with a different layer, uh, excuse me, layer and layout and camera angle or camera shot, if you will. You see, with manga, and what makes it different from other novels, is that it shows different camera shots or camera angles in order to tell the story even further. Most manga do this, while western comics are usually flat and usually not really use that many camera angles to show events or different perspectives. However, in the case of manga, there is consistent use of different perspective and in order to tell the story in a more meaningful way. To list them in depth would take a while, but to require some knowledge about storytelling and symbolism, I'll give you some ideas. So let's start with this. Let's talk about camera height and positioning. In storytelling, the camera height and, or position tells the story just as much as everything else. I often say that when we talk about soundtracks in games, they need to tell the story without using words, but instead the music. For example, take the Yakuza Kiwami opening and its theme. Just for a moment, I'll show a short clip. As you can see, there are several camera angles in the opening, all giving different messages and indications as to who is what and what is who. The figure who walks from the helicopter in slow motion, all black with a long coat pointing the gun, to Nishikiyama who runs his hair back in blood, clearly the villain of the story, to the main protagonist, Kazuma Kiryu, in almost every shot you're looking up at him. Some shots are looking down, yes, however, it's not to show the lack of power, but the lack of power that the goons have compared to the might of Kiryu Kazuma. 
because he's so strong. The guy's a beast. Anyways, manga is exactly the same way. Take what you just watched and pretend it was drawn with line art, which is the drawing style that manga and anime use. Now, if we apply this to D-Link, you can see just how when Razor Akihiro vaults from the upper floor railing, we're looking up at him. Not only because of the height, but also because he's supposed to be a very powerful enemy that will engage with the heroes of the story. You will see this everywhere. Looking down is to show powerlessness. Looking up is to show power or hope. Tilted angles is to represent uneasiness or fear. Sometimes suspicion. Looking far away at the character or with something in the background that is larger than the character represents how small small they are in this overlooking arc of whatever it is that the hero is meant to go on. It's symbolism, and manga uses it on each and every single page in some small way or other. Sometimes not at all, and then when it does happen it's a big deal, but usually on every page there's some sort of symbolism. Open up any manga and I bet you'll be there some sort of symbolic angle or shot. Now, we should also talk about distance and view. For distance and view, uh, take these two panels in D-Link, where the main protagonist, Kenzaki Daigami, is sitting on the dock with his friends, uh, Shikio and Trayton. The camera angle is far from them, showing these three of them together in a much larger space than they are together, showing that the three of them in what will soon be this large world is bigger than what they imagined, especially since Kenzaki was transported to this new world, he has a lot to explore. In this panel, though, however, where he talks about how he feels scared, worried, isolated, a little lost, and confused, you see a large ocean behind him, again, showing that there's something bigger than him that he'll, he will have to take a part of, which is his overall destiny. It's dramatic, but that's how most of manga is. I'm a sucker for J-drama. Let's talk about style! So when we talk about style, we're looking at how the characters are dressed, what it says about them, what the style of the manga is, the hair, the art style, the way that things look, etc. These tell the story as well, because a brief brings the world together in uniform, everything looks like they fit together, and that's a big part of what tells the story. This will lead us into character stance and body language. When we look at character stance and body language, take the cover of these three mangas. We're going to use D-Link, Full Metal Alchemist, and Bleach. Fun fact about Bleach. Did you know the inside joke about Bleach? And why it's titled that way is because the manga and the anime were so bloody that the characters had to bleach their clothes for the next episode. Just thought you'd like to know that. Impress your friends at the dinner party. Anyways, in any event, let's take these three covers. Look at how they were all positioned. The first one has the characters all sitting in a triangle formation to show Trinity, to show that the three of them are unified and together. This catastrophe, the mirror in the middle being shattered, and that they are holding it all together. If you look at how each of them are positioned, it gives a more foreshadowing effect, not only to the story, but also to the characters. So let's look at this a little more. Kinzaki is sitting upon the mirror, known as the Grand Gateway, to say that he is the one who commands it and even rules it. He even sits upon it like a throne of some kind, which foreshadows his destiny. Trayton on the right sits relaxed, slouched, comfortable, stretched out. This shows his relaxed nature and carefree attitude, enjoying life, but also his confidence within himself. When we look at Shikyo Yoshikawa on the left, he's more reserved, more inward towards himself, holding cards as he looks out into space, thinking. This shows not only his more introverted nature on contrast to Trayton and Kinzaki, but also his more let's think before we do nature, which is opposite to Trayton, who is willing to speak first and let his voice be heard, or Kinzaki, who still has a ways to go before he can claim his destiny. These characteristics are of importance, they show you exactly who the characters are and how they are to be perceived or how to perceive them before you even open up the manga. And then when you read it, you go, oh, I get it. And then as the story goes forward in each volume, you learn more and more about each character and you learn that they are just like you and I, multifaceted people with many sides to them. That's what makes them feel real. When we look at Fullmetal Alchemist, the main protagonist, Edward Elric, the one in the red cloak and the white gloves, you can see that he looks fierce, determined, powerful, almost angry of some kind. When we're looking up at him, he has a weight to him. And if you look, it looks like his hand is made of metal, similar to his brother Al, who is the knight behind him. Notice the gears and the cogs behind them both, and even on the volume number label, also known as the chapter sticker or volume label, it doesn't matter. The point is, you can see that this has something to do with machinery and possibly magic, which is what the point of the series is, or at least a large part of. And lastly, if we look at Bleach, although it's not as flashy as D-Link or Fullmetal Alchemist, it's simplistic form and yet so 
powerful has a style of its own. The style is rough but sharp, the coloring is vibrant, and even on the header of the title, the main character, Ichigo Kurosaki, holds a tight fist while sword is prominently in front of him, highlighting something special about the sword, about him. Which, by the way, is a very big part of the manga, as he obtains a Bankai, in short, a special ability called Zengetsu that gives him unbelievable powers as a reaper. I suggest watching the anime or reading the manga to learn more. However, when we look at the style of each of these three manga covers, we can see that they are all styled. They're vibrant, edgy, young adult and teen focused, symbolism of some kind. You know, there's always something about them that brings them together. Um, and with the story, they have catchy names, they have different characters, they all have their own gimmicks and style, whether it would be vibrant colors and fantastical realism for the cover of D-Link, or the grungy and heavy metal like Fullmetal Alchemist, or the sharp, quick, variant sword-cutting edges of Bleach, they all have their own style. These tell the story even before you open them up for the 53rd time, or the first. I'll throw in both Volume 2 for D-Link and for Soul Eater for bonus examples, just so that you really get the idea that they all have their own way of telling the story and wanting to bring the reader in. D-Link with its cheerful yellow and Soul Eater with its gothic style. So I also recommend Black Butler as well, just to give one more example. Video game covers do the exact same thing, however, there's a little more cinematic in a sense. They have a little more of a cinematic style and cinematic edge. Take Kingdom Hearts, Final Fantasy XV, Sly Cooper, Yakuza, Red Dead Redemption, Star Ocean till the end of time, and so many others. They all have a movie-like or manga-like style based on the company or style that they're going for. Each game has its own theme, color palette, story, and direction. Each one feels like its own adventure. Because it is. In the case of manga, it's no different. Each cover tells its own story, how each panel has its own gradual progression of the story. When we look deeper at manga and compare it to the video games, we see that they both incorporate a strong sense of storytelling, deep creativity, and interactive learning. They engage the reader, player, or viewer to actually engage, to actively engage with the medium on some level or other in order to get the true experience possible. No other mediums can do this, not movies, not streaming services, not traditional text novels. Video games and manga are the secret to interactive storytelling and visual learning because it brings the user into the world of storytelling and get them involved in whatever story is being said or told, both physically and through visual stimulation. It keeps them wrapped up in something that feels larger than life. Each page of a manga feels captivating. Each stroke of ink on the page is a detail to overlook. Each panel has something to say or show. Manga is visually engaging and emotionally gratifying. You grow connected, attached. You feel as though you have gone on some kind of adventure with these characters. You read and you read, and the more you turn the page, the more you feel like you're there. Anime does this extremely well, with connecting viewers of the performance to the characters. You see, manga means a lot to people, and it means so much more to many hearts. Hell, I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a good sense volume of the Kingdom Hearts manga. Manga is something that you can't compare to anything. It's a type of art form that has to be experienced and appreciated in order to truly understand. Manga is a form of visual storytelling that captivates its viewers by really looking them in or talking them into the story, and it's something that not even TV. Oh, oh, wait. Yes, hang on, there is. There is something on TV that is like this. It's something on TV. Something about TV, no, not anime, but something, something else that has to do with all this. It may seem far-fetched, but they're all in the same category. Video games, anime, manga, there is. Let me, let me see if I can find it. It may seem far-fetched, but uh, trust me, it's something visually engaging, something that uh, relates to both video games, manga, interactive learning, visual storytelling. Uh, where, where is it? There is, hang on, uh, let me pause. Uh, okay, uh, where is it? Uh, is it there? No. This? Oh, no. What the hell is... Okay, uh, what about this? Ooh. Oh, God. Where did I get this? Oh, God. Okay. Uh, let me... I was just gonna put that there. Um, oh, I still had this. Oh, my God. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let me find... When did I buy this? All right. Okay. Ah, oh, I found it. Okay. Ha <laughs> ha. Found you. Whew. All right, let's pop this in.
wrestling is another perfect example. Sorry, let me rephrase. <clears throat> was a perfect example of interactive physical storytelling. You had a wide range and vast range of characters with gimmicks and personas, with real acting, genuine performances, and breathtaking atmospheres. You had heroes, villains, characters lost in the middle. You had story arcs that spanned back all the way to the early 90s that carried out into the 2010s. There were storylines that built up for three years at minimum or more. It was incredible. The saga continues in every which way. So much so, it was hard to keep up with them all at times. Wrestling created a cultural following that spread to the masses for millions on millions of people around the world and it looked like it was even more on TV when you were viewing it in the United States where it was being held. Areas used to be sold out at every show if it was an outdoor venue. Hell, the arenas were sold out at every show when it was televised. Fans were crammed and packed together so tight that when a wrestler would go over the barricade, they had a hard time getting back over. They were loved by everyone. The world of wrestling was home to millions of fans who believed in the very world that WWE was trying to bring to life. A good book I highly recommend is called Ball 4, where it talks about how American society used to look up to baseball players, but they truly weren't the kind of people you believed them to be. This is a similar extent to the world wrestling entertainment industry. However, it was a world like none other, a world that can only be described as electrifying, both on the field and in the ring. The stories were captivating, characters were catchy, held likable, or if they were a villain, easily hateable and very much disliked. The world came alive, the stories were real, they felt real. If you cried when your favorite hero lost, the villain made sure to rub it in your face. And you were angered when the villain got a cheap win over them. You cheered when your favorite wrestler did the most superhuman defying moves and promos you could imagine. You laughed when insults were slung around and slapped back and forth. After all, a big part of the wrestling was the trash talk. First slam, I'm gonna take care of that smelly, greasy, nasty animal. And I'm gonna get you too, Rhino. Oh, Tonight, uh... No, no! I am the game, and in this very ring, uh, for the next 20 minutes, uh, Is he constipated? I'm going to be talking uh, and saying absolutely nothing. Uh. I think it was possible, but I think I finally found somebody in the company that's whiter than I am. <laughs> As comedic, cringy, aged, or even serious as the trash talk was, it never got old. The writing made it feel like the world was that much more real, and that the stories that they were telling felt that much more real. The world felt larger than life. It felt as though they were true. I talk about this in past tense because the product is no longer the same. Ask any wrestling fan, and they'll more than likely say the same. You see, it felt that way because it was made that way. Because to us, when wrestling was good, it was real. Somewhere along the line, WWE forgot what storytelling was about. Somewhere along the line, they forgot what made wrestling wrestling. Somewhere along the line, they forgot that to millions of people, they were offering an escape every week. They were giving joy. They were providing entertainment that did feel like entertainment but an adventure, with a cast of characters that seemed at the center of the world for TV every week. We felt as though the characters were not only real but connected. The wrestling world was something that brought a kind of magic that wasn't just flashy gimmicks and lots of fireworks. It was something that brought a kind of charisma to the entertainment scene. It was a type of theater not for a play of those of the faint of heart, but those who wanted to see something that was breathtaking and something that felt so real you could touch it. Wrestling wasn't this interpretive dance style we see today, hence why I'm only showing clips of when it was good, but rather real characters with real motives and real agendas. Well, as real as it could get. You followed the stories every week. You bought the hats, the masks, the shirts. You made the signs to show appreciation, to get the attention and chant and cheer of your favorite wrestler. You worried for them, cared for them, admired them. Wrestlers were giving teens and young adults in their 20s and over something to hold on to, something to believe in, something to enjoy. Wrestling was a big part of the many lives that I know. Hell, even my college professors were into wrestling. 
Many of the people that I talked to have expressed how much they enjoyed watching John Cena, Kurt Angle, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and many others come out to the ring and suplex everyone in the ring. How they cheered at home when they saw, saw when they saw Shawn Michaels or Chris Jericho come out on stage and get ready to suplex everybody, and, and when they're going for a title win or when they were ready to doing their taunts or gimmicks on stage when they were ready to win another championship. Speaking of championships, by the way, they didn't feel just like belts made of solid gold. They felt like treasure. They felt important. They felt like they were worth more than the president's seat in the Oval Office. All right, all right, okay. Maybe that was an exaggeration, but is it? Back in the day, the titles were so important to someone for some reason or other, you saw them bleed for it, literally. You saw them bleed for it, cry for it, turn evil for it. You've seen people jump off ladders or put people through tables for it. They almost killed for it. They were forced to go beyond normal limits for it. Wrestling reinforces an idea long gone and long since dead. Dreams can come true. It means something to those people, and I say those people because they weren't just characters, they were people. And they weren't just people people, they were a special kind of people. They were the people that were special to us. I like to believe that fictional characters aren't just characters, but people. They have a connection. The reason why I hope brought up professional wrestling in the first place is because in a lot of ways it's similar to manga, in both the sense of its constant over-the-top and flashy gimmicks, but also the vast and colorful world, the wide variety and cast of array of characters, each with their own goals, motives, feelings, agendas, their own blood and personality. They feel human. And because of that, we did what we did with wrestling with what we do with manga. You followed the stories every week. You bought the hats. You bought the accessories such as backpacks or bags, the shirts. You bought the mangas and brought them to school because the ones in the library weren't the best. You uh, even showed your appreciation to get the attention and chant and cheer of your favorite character. You'd rush home to the TV eagerly waiting for that episode to start. I remember when I was a kid back in the 2000s, I used to come home every day and I'd, after school and I'd watch anime. And during lunch at school, I'd read the manga of whatever anime I was watching at the time. I remember going home and getting a bag of my favorite snack. I remember getting a refreshing drink of some kind of my favorite snack and watching anime. Hell, there was one whole summer where I spent just watching anime. I'm pretty sure there were actually several summers where I just spent, sat watching anime. But regardless, those lazy afternoons with the sunlight, just right, and the summer air, it was tranquil. Just me and my friends. Well, fictional televised connectional friends. <laughs> uh, well, regardless, when it comes to manga, the characters feel true. You worried for them, cared for them, you admired them. Manga were giving kids, teens, and young adults something to hold on to, something to believe in, something to enjoy. Sounds like what I just said about wrestling, right? It seems as though the pattern is true. Storytelling is giving us a lot in more ways than one, from interactive learning to visual storytelling to engagement on another level. It's just pure magic. Manga was a big part of the lives that I know. You watch the characters laugh, cry, turn evil, die, suffer, triumph, come out on top and fight for their dream. There was not one manga that isn't a classic where the main character won't go above and beyond to achieve whatever it is that they want in their world. Reinforcing the idea that dreams can come true. It's almost like storytelling is... Well, never mind. Storytelling is important to our culture. It's been around for thousands of years, probably a lot longer than just thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, since the first cave we know in Spain. Pretty sure there's one in France as well, I believe as well. But regardless, it, when it comes to storytelling, it is the very fabric that holds entertainment and community together. The Native American tribes built a whole culture around it. Same with ancient China and feudal Japan. If you look at Greek mythology, storytelling is vital to our culture, to who we are as people. It's a large fabric in the quilt of society seen with video games, manga, these mediums through storytelling and interactive learning. They teach us so much, yet we give so little. Why is that? Storytelling needs to be shown more, needs to be taught more, needs to be raised in awareness, and needs to be used more. Storytelling does wonders for people. People who listen to stories, write stories, design stories. It's fun and amazing to get wrapped up into a tale that seems so close, yet only in a dream. We need to start using storytelling in the workplace, in schools. We need to start to get college students more involved in creativity and in the arts. Storytelling helps us learn so much. Messages, motifs. Take the video game Fable 3. As long as someone has power, if they abuse it, they will lose it. Power can be your downfall or your ascension. 
storytelling helps us learn, helps us engage, helps us understand to communicate through the narrative. If it was taught more in schools, encouraged more in the workplace, appreciated more by the masses to a larger extent, I think people would wonder, how can I tell stories that captivate millions? How can I tell a story that benefits the workplace? How can I get my students engaged in a story and help them learn on a subject of interest? These are questions that no one is asking. These are tools and resources no one is using. Why can't students show that their talent of storytelling is impressive and they bring it to whatever subject they're learning? Why can't companies have a story of the day and get the creative minds flowing or a message to be given to enforce a healthy workplace culture? Why can't we get more people talking about stories? There is so much of it out there, yet no one is talking about it. Fans of anime and manga and video games will talk about it, sure, but it seems like that's all there is. We need to get it out there more. We need to start encouraging people to learn that storytelling is an art. Not everyone may be talented in it, or like it, or even be good at it, or want to be a part of it. It's an intellectual art, and some people are more doers than thinkers, or more into blue-collar work than white-collar jobs, and you know what? That's fine. Let's stay that way. But when it comes to the intellectual environment, or a talent-like mind where storytelling is a strength, why can't we have it to where more people overall realize that storytelling teaches us how to survive, how to love, how to hate, how to appreciate, how to value, how to judge, how to think, how to feel? Stories are what makes us learn from a young age. It captivates adults in films. Hell, look at what video games have to offer. Storytelling defines a generation, does it not? What happens when you turn old and gray and your kid or grandkid or someone walks up to you and asks you an in-depth question, looking for some sort of guidance? More than likely, you'll say, there's a story I have about that. Stories teach us so much, from thinking like a detective, to opening up our emotions and seeing just how delicate we are, to looking up to heroes and ready to stop villains, or to being blown away by a superhuman performance. Storytelling, it's all around us. We need more of it. We need to be seen more. We need it to make a comeback. <laughs>